the thinking process and go straight to the spirit of an individual. In other words, people today believe that they can get direct information from God into their spirit, and this information can run contrary to what the Bible says. I think today people are basically biblically illiterate. They don't know doctrine. They don't have a frame of reference because they don't understand the essentials of the historic Christian faith. And therefore, so often, prophets will come to them and they will say, God told me this or that. Now, that revelation knowledge can be completely contrary to the canon of Scripture, but people don't know it because they don't know the Word of God. So I think one of the primary weaknesses in the church today is that Christians don't understand essential Christian doctrine. They don't know what the Bible says so that they can easily be duped through these prophets who claim to have revelation knowledge direct from God. I think also that so many Christians are duped through experience. And we are to test all of our experiences, in fact, test all things by the Word of God and hold on to what is true. Because the Bible says that there were false prophets among the people in biblical time, but there will also be false teachers among us today. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute in their greed. The Bible says these teachers are going to exploit you with stories they have made up. These people will give you a story based on revelation knowledge. Now, they're either being tricked by their own minds or they're listening to lying spirits. Either way, they're deceiving people into following false doctrines. And in many cases, these false doctrines come directly out of the metaphysical cults or they can even be as aberrant as affirming the essential tenets of the New Age movement or even old age pagan Hinduism. Are there any eternal or temporal dangers in being persuaded by these doctrines? The basic problem is that people begin looking to themselves. The focus is not on Christ. It is not on a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness, but it is a gospel of greed which manipulates a person to focus in on what they can get out of Christianity. In other words, Jesus Christ becomes a means to an end as opposed to being the end. People turn on to Jesus Christ because of what he will do for them. They come to the master's table not because they love the master, but because of what is on the master's table. I like what Spurgeon said. He said the old covenant was a covenant of prosperity. The new covenant is a covenant of adversity whereby we are being weaned from the present world. Christianity is diametrically metrically opposite to what is being purveyed by these false prophets. Christianity says, life is a vapor, here today, gone tomorrow, look to eternity. You are sojourners. This is not your home. Your dwelling place is another kingdom. One of the most tragic results experienced by ex-cult members is a faith crisis. Many become so burnt out that they are just not interested in trying to find God again. The spiritual casualties of mind control are truly heartbreaking and devastating. In 1982, the Rajneeshis staged their first annual world celebration. With the crowds came the first signs of anxiety. Steve Sobel was hired to provide a security force of trained experts. They wanted uh, the show of force so that anyone who had the idea that possibly assassinate Bhagwan or do harm to him would not, uh, would not think about it so readily if he saw the weapons that we had. Rajneesh already had trained bodyguards brought from India. Most of them are what they call samurais, and they've been trained in martial arts to kill people with their bare hands. Protection for Rajneesh was not the only thing Sobel's men were asked to provide. They definitely were very interested when I was there in the use and the tactical use of instinctive shooting of uh, certain things that one learns in the military. Was the Rajneesh hierarchy looking toward the future? 
if it's necessary for our peace, for our safety, for our survival, to take over the county government of this county, then of course we'll do it. Like those who chose to follow Hitler and Jones, the Rajneeshis have surrendered their identities and their judgment to the master. All they have left is a deep emotional identification with Rajneesh and the commune. When the commune appears strong, their master appears omnipotent, their surrender justified. But as time goes by, more and more ex-sannyasins are coming forward with ugly revelations of abuse, suffering, and crime. The vision of paradise is melting away, and with it, the credibility of the master. The Rajneeshis are being faced with the terrible possibility that they have sacrificed their lives, their careers, and their children for the empty promises of a clever opportunist. Like Hitler and Jones, ashram leaders have begun to use fear and hate to unify their people. Of Hitler, an admiring Rajneesh has said, He writes in his autobiography, Menken, that people are not united because of love. Love has no power. All power comes through hatred. Create hatred and they will become united. And I can fully understand his insight. In a world well acquainted with the rhetoric of religious terrorism, the Guru's words have a familiar ring. They have a paramilitary preparation that is frightening. The most fundamental rule of this violent life is all means are good if they fulfill the end. And of course, rather than arguing, it is better to pull the sword. It decides things immediately. It is easier to fight with a person and decide who is right. Might is right. That rule still remains. The rule of the jungle. He could tell them to do anything and they would do it. You know, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. It is right if they say it's right. Fear and hate, guilt and paranoia, the unstable ingredients of mind control in Berlin, in Jonestown, in Rajneeshpuram. It's clear the morality of the man-made God provides only one answer upon which we may depend. All means are good if they fulfill the end. You will die, you will have to take anybody over all of our dead bodies. Might is right. He's more than God. I only know I love him. I'd do anything that he asked me to. Pull the sword. I would die for you right now, Dad. I'm prepared to die for this family. My people have nothing to lose. You are in God. Life is a joke. In God. I believe she'd blow you away in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. I got a hell of a lot of weapons to fight! I got guns! I got guns! I got a hell of a lot to fight! All means are good if the person the end. As we've seen, the unstable ingredients of mind control begin with fear and end with hatred. Interestingly enough, you can remember those ingredients through the acronym FLESH, F-L-E-S-H. F, of course, stands for fear, and 
fear is the ultimate master. We're talking here not only about a physical fear, but a psychological fear as well. We're talking about the intimidation tactics of the group to control you in virtually every dimension of your life. The L in the acronym FLESH stands for love. And what we're talking about here is a displaced love, a, a love for the guru and the group that creates psychological dependency. It was ironic, I think, to see Shannon Jo Ryan, the daughter of Leo Ryan, who was shot while investigating the massacre of Jonestown, actually say about Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, I love him so much, I can see through him existence in a different way. She said, I see incredible beauty, I want to be near him, I'd do anything he asked me to do. This is what we're talking about when we begin to love the leader of a group as opposed to the Lord of the universe. Well, the E in the acronym FLESH stands for emptiness. As Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh clearly told us, the goal is to create a new man, one who is happily mindless. So they try to empty the mind through altered states of consciousness, through hypnotic meditation. They try to create a blank tablet on which Satan can write his deadly message. The S uh, in the acrostic or the acronym flesh stands for sex. And here we're talking about an attraction for sex rather than attraction for God. Sexual manipulation is a mind control technique by gurus. They either deprive you of sex, as is common with uh, the Moonies or the Hare Krishnas, or they create an environment of free sex, as we've seen in the ashram of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, or by cults like the Children of God. And then the H. The H, the acronym, stands for hatred. Hatred becomes the key, not love. Love has no power, said Hitler. All power comes through hatred. Create hatred and we become united. And this is how, as we've seen, Jim Jones controlled his people. He created a straw man and he angrily denounced this straw man as the fascist government who was out to get them. And in that way, he galvanized his people into a cohesive group that was going to fight the common enemy. So hatred, the last key to mind control. Paul told us not to walk according to the deeds of the flesh, but rather according to the deeds of the spirit. Paul the apostle encouraged us to let the mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. In another place he said, for we have the mind of Christ. It is important that our minds be governed and directed by the Holy Spirit. There are many people out there who are willing to twist your minds. They will bring you into false concepts and false doctrines. The Bible warns about those shepherds who feed themselves and not the flock. Beware of any kind of doctrine that would elevate you to the state of being God. Beware of that kind of faith that people say you can exercise as God exercised faith in creating realities. It is important that we have that mind of Christ which was in reality that of surrendering himself and submitting himself unto the will of God and not trying to exalt or elevate himself. God did that after he surrendered himself. The true God can do anything, but we are his servants and in subjection to him. Within all of us, there is a God-shaped vacuum. Throughout the ages, man has attempted to fill that void with the things of the world. But it is only through a relationship with our Creator that we can be truly satisfied. His Holy Scriptures reveal the way in which we can be reconciled to God, and that is through the provisions of His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Join us again for another edition of The Pagan Invasion.